Far too much to I got really greedy and I wanted to do something really good. Like I have way too much. So I'll be going fast through some of this. We may not get to the end of what I brought, or we'll just keep going and leave them. Okay? So we'll see what happens with that. Um, uh, I, I, I'm going to do something that I haven't done in other lectures. Um, uh, I'm going to try to, uh, you'll see a lot of this stuff that I show in just about every lecture I give, but uh, I'm trying to weave another little story uh, into this, and we'll see if it works. Well, we start with this image by Ian Anthony Finman. Mm -hmm. It's a little Sparta, outside of Edinburgh, it's one of the most amazing bars inside of it. It's uh, loaded with objects that are saturated with time. And so that's what, that's a, Granted, I can run through what I want to show you. This is really the first slide of the lecture, and this is a real close up. So each of these little squares are about an eighth of an inch big, and there's, there's two layers, or I think there's two layers of tracing paper and another layer there. So this is, I, when I left here, I knew I had not really done my thesis the way I wanted to, so I did a few more comments in the following year after I graduated. This is one, this is a close-up of one of the drawings of Jesus I did. So it's like, I don't know, six or three things. And so I don't know what the past is, and I'm like a, a crazy man drawing the mortar joints between these eight pipes. Crazy. Crazy. This is another grid. This is the grid that I study now. And this is a grid that's much easier. Self-forming doesn't happen one line at a time. It's not composed. It happens. It happens completely in its entire body uh, over time through its own mud, muddy gear and world. <clears throat> so that's so. This is the short. This is my little short autobiography. Here, and I promise you, I won't do any more autobiography from now on. And let me stop. Here's a more interesting bit because the water that had made the mud, the mud in the first place is, is also impressed itself in the mud kind of grid, uh, but the mud form over it. Now, I'm a sailor. <coughs> if you know how to sail, you'll know that when you are in a sailboat, the rig is fixed. It's actually a static thing. So the sails and all the ropes and everything are tied down to the correct angle. It doesn't move and yet the boat moves. Here's a modern example. So look at the rig and the sails. They're absolutely static. This is an engine with no moving parts. Pretty powerful engine you can see. But nothing moves. The wind is the fuel, and the engine is made of nothing but proportion and job. This. I took this photograph this summer from an airplane looking down at the ocean, and uh, this is a wind pattern on the water. So this is a fixed form created by something moving. Inverse of the sailboat. Of course, it's moving. I mean, it's slowly moving, but it's moving like a uh, minute. You can't see it. So these are reminders to me. Um, these are reminders to me that there are no fixed forms. There are only forms in process. Even though they appear to be fixed, in fact, it's not. And this is not a metaphor for anything. Just the way things are. It's just, it's just how it is. Concrete, plastic, amorphous, stupid, stupid. 
and rock and rock. It can take any form as long as you're able to hold it still longer. Very long. So this is what we usually do with it. We take collective views as we usually do with it. And it ends up looking like four words and pieces of firewood or cement called cylinders prismatic shapes. And that's because the molds are made out of sticks and sheets. And um, I think I said down the reading, I don't know how many of you did. Okay, see, did any of you guys do the reading that I sent? And is it just like a performance and a reading? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, it's here. You can read it. It's, a, it's, um, my, it's my essay in this book, which is just out this month. So, um, you get that chapter for free. <laughs> and, um, but there's a, a description of how we ended up with all those sticks and sheets. In industrial activity. But the point I want to make here is what happens when you cast in something which is flexible and more flexible. It responds to the forces imposed on it, responds geometrically to the forces imposed on it by those plastic metals or concrete. This is a wall being built in Tokyo by Kenzo Uno, one of the co inventors of fabric form, but co re inventors of fabric form. From the um, He's casting in a construction method. So now you see the walls have energy in them. It's absolutely readable. The pressure of the concrete is absolutely readable in the architecture and the surface of the earth. This on the left is the mold uh, not yet closed. So there's the reinforcing steel on one side, and then the other side will put onto it. And standard um, form ties with oversized washers to make these little, little form balls. So you'll notice there's almost nothing in the form line. This standard wall former, the same size, it's just like the same, same size walls, and that's probably three quarter inch plywood and steel. But there's a lot of material here, a lot of muscle. Here, the reinforcing steel holds its own formwork. And the only real structure for the, for the mold is the bracing. The rest of it is just um, hundreds of times less material. So you measure by volume and weight. The cost, by the way, the cost is like not a hundred times, but a fraction. These materials, the fabric materials, by the way, that I'm using here, cost about a dollar a square meter. So they're essentially free from construction costs. And also, everything I'll show you is done in flat sheets of fabric, no tailor. That's a builder's constraint. It may be possible for anyone in the world to do it just right off the roll, put it in place, and then you can make um, any of these things. When you pass in a permeable fabric, the first thing that happens is all the air bubbles pass through the mold hole. So you get a perfect. Then it starts to bleed excess mixed water under pressure. The fabric is right permeability. But the cheap geotextiles that we use are engineered for permeability. That's that's one of the design factors in the DNA textiles to put in brand. So we get an almost clear water. You see this very little cement base in the water, you clear, almost clear water bleed. That's the excess mixed water. It's acting as a filter, and you're getting a cement-rich paste you right at the surface of the cast. And that goes in some couple centimeters, so it's a surface effect. But here's a graph showing um, so um, this time, and that's the compressive strength of the concrete. The black line is a cylinder, it's test results of cylinders of concrete casting in oil through cylinders, like the one with the engineering test. And the green and the red are cylinders, cylinder molds are two different permeable fabric forms. So you can see in the cylinders, it's about approximately 10% increase in the compressive strength just by changing the mold material. You don't get that increased strength, by the way, when you're doing larger sections because um, it's a surface effect. But if you do it in a much higher quality concrete, and very, very beautiful. It doesn't even look like it doesn't look like concrete. It looks like Next time. 
There's a standard column rule. Here's a fabric two. On the right, it's a 30, 30 foot column spanning one lip. And just keep poly up, poly up, poly up, poly up in the fabric. Here's a little video. It's a little jerky, but I don't know why this green fabric is so crappy. But see this? Here it goes. There's no joint between the bottom of this column and the foundation. You don't need it. You just have to hold it down long enough to get about six inches of concrete. And it stiffens up by the pre-stress and the, by the, by the tension in the, in the, in the mold skin. That's completely counterintuitive, isn't it? But that's how it works. This is a photograph from a villa in Puerto Rico, 13 sculptural columns, each one a different height and slightly different capital. Uh, and I built those. Flew down with the form working my checkbook. Uh, so that's the form of the 13 columns and 13 unique columns and a few stairs. This is a drawing I received from Jun Su Cho Architects in Korea for a building that they were built. One of these tilt up walls in concrete, so it casts on the ground and tilt it up into place. Uh, and they wanted these deeply creased uh, facades, and, and could they be done out of everything? So uh, I did some sketches, sent them sketches, we made some models, sent them photographs with arrows, and this, and this, and that, photographs of the models in plaster, and then you know, they, they actually made several full scale prototypes of different methods. Former, chose the fabric former. In this case, under the fabric uh, uh, are these plastic pipes. <clears throat> so we call these impactos, because they're impacting the uh, membrane. And those were cast horizontally, lifted in place. So when you cast in a fabric mold, there's an entirely new uh, universe of geometries and form that become possible and become inevitable. Well, not really, because you can always back it up with a flat. So you can go from completely prismatic to whatever the tension and the wrinkle and all those things. My, the, the structural and architectural formwork research came out of a sculptural practice, my own sculptural practice. So these are images of sculptures being made, and while the concrete is still plastic, you know, you can impose force upon the mold, and the mold, of course, will respond. These things are. More verb than noun for me. Less object than story. Something happened. These are action things. Explicitly action things. And this uh, motion and energy which is frozen. Much like slides so to open these slides. Because this is not metaphors. It's, it's a real thing. It's just an actual thing. Maybe they're available in other words, but that's not how I, how I want to present them. Simply as, as facts. I think you know the etymological uh, origin of the word fact is a thing kept. That's a joint between two different fabrics. You can see, not only can we see the zigzag stitch, and we'll see the stitch. Can you see the little clumps of cement paste in the needle holes? See that? This is concrete not as we know it. It's incredibly sensitive. It's not the brutal masculine beauty that we're supposed to know. Love. I know. And now it's to me like because the beginning is something quite uh, gentle and sensual. The construction details produce ornament. It's self-ornamenting in its um, 
action. In that sense, it's, it's alive and it records its closures or its constraints in an ornamental production. Okay, now, no structures. This person, could be you, is providing the tension resistance to make this handy with the Right? Okay, so structures, it's a static structure. It's working as a static structure, but it requires an energy input for it to work. Constant flow of energy into the system for things. I am not. The energy flow stops. There's no energy going into the system anymore, and yet the structure is still holding itself. What's the difference between that and that? Of course, that not is So there's a living energy running through static structures which doesn't move and doesn't consume any energy. To me, this is a, a beautiful mystery. And I don't know how to explain this because of it's a riddle that I haven't solved, but displays, at least to my way of thinking, um, that the things which we think are static and dead are in fact very much alive in a different way. So this is me trying to solve the mystery that I hear the moaning of the structure of the road. It's very difficult to hear. You have a parabola, it's how you make a parabola. You basically, you have a motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is the, the stone is been thrown. And that's the shape of falling. It's a parabolic shape. And what we have here, of course, is a series of uniform divisions of time which show us the bourgeois and the arch. And if we take the same shape of falling to a series of concentrated loads, as we expect in this case, that's the hanging chain above. So there's a funicular tension structure. If you take that's the bending moment curve for a human, there's some reason for a human. Exactly the bending, exactly the bending moment curve, not matter if you take that and you let the steel take that shape in the bending moment shape beam, I won't go into this, there's no special steps, don't worry. But we find that the angle of that line, the perpendicular line, has a vertical and horizontal component. And the vertical component exactly matches the vertical shear, and the horizontal component exactly matches the force uh, for the uh, resisting model. So, I mean, these are the you, this, when I have my structures classes in this classroom, that's a good thing. In this classroom, or my structure class, I felt that the secrets of the universe were being looked at. So, we would like to be able to make a very efficient beam that follows the bending moment curve. Like all long span structures must. But maybe we can do it in short span structures and save material effort. So here's two examples of how you can take a rectangular sheet, flat rectangular sheet of fabric, and make a variable section. Or you can just take that rectangle and make a variable section be like ruching it down with the space between the tables and the floor, and the space between the tables. There's a $5 worth of material, and that's the same fabric stretch you do as a moment. This is a photograph from a pre-test factory in Winnipeg, Canada, where I worked for many years, and um, these are just prototypes. We're trying stuff out at full scale that we have already done in one different model. Try this, try that. So here's a bending moment shape beam passed from a single, single sheet of fabric. And you see we're saving material along the longitudinal section, but we're also varying the, the transverse section. The feed uh, compression material, concrete compression zones, starve 
property and other pensions of it. We've just not been able to see those pensions. You say, no, notionally, we could say a third of the county can use this kind of thing. This is what I like to think of as a shroud of turn. This is a kid's thing. Here's a 12 year, 40 foot long double canopy regime, shaped to follow the bedding of the curve. That's cast in this piece of fabric, about $50 worth of material, stretched between the table. So, again, notionally, this is the amount of concrete we might say in the Now, understand, this is if you know what the proposed load will be on the beam. It's not going to change. They're not changed that much. The rectangular beam has its maximum depth anywhere in, or along the span, and so you can have its maximum moment anywhere along the span. It's very difficult to change. This beam is more efficient, therefore less robust. But that's you're always in that dilemma of increased robustness, less efficiency, and more resistance. So this is a search for a very efficient beam. And here's a model. We're loading the model with water. And there's the crack pattern in the model. And this beam, like the diagram I showed you, is only one line of pension reinforced this cable. It was one of the bottom of the sort of member from the Pickering Congress. Are these guys still doing um, beam design? Steel design of beams? So you know, those of you who have done that class already, there's no spirits in this beam. There's only one line of tension reinforcing the whole thing. That's the crack pattern from the strain of the steel. That's a five meter version. The same, essentially the same crack pattern. Now, here's the beam taken off the test, test equipment, and it's, it's broken. So that's the thing. Well, put it right back together again, and it turns out it is an arch, but a reversed arch, where the compression blocks of the spars are in a straight line, and the tension pod is in a curve. Can you imagine this thing, right? We could support it there and there, right? Pull it up like this, that doesn't get tension, and all of the slides get squeezed together. So, we made a beam, we broke it, and it failed as a beam. We put it back together again, and it's an arch. So, is it a beam or an arch? This is the beginning of my more sophisticated structure lessons. Whereas the great things in the beam, you know, I said, oh my God, is a beam really a beam? Could it be like, is it, how does the beam decide whether it's going to act as a large or whether it's going to act as a beam? So in the mold making operations on the structural side, we're taking these flat sheets and seeing the different kinds of shapes that we can give beams. And at the same time, there's a series of, now that we know we can make these molds really easily and simply, there's a series of uh, engineering research being done at various universities around the world to see what the real shapes should be and how they might be reinforced and what kind of reinforcement we can get rid of and how much um, material we can save. And you know, as far as sustainable construction is concerned, cement paste is a really nasty material. Not only is it very high temperature production, you probably already know what that is. You burn in a lot of fuel when you make the cement, but the chemical reactions of making the cement give up tremendous amounts of greenhouse gases. It's a very, very nasty. So, but it's a super valuable material, and the whole world knows it. It's the most used material in the world next to water. So, the uh, urgency of reducing the amount of concrete cement, or the cement that we use, is quite real. And this is one way to go about it. Now, there's another way to reduce material. You see the crack pattern. It's okay, it's going to crack like that. But everywhere the concrete is cracked, it's not working. Right? Concrete works in compression. So there's a crack in this, it's not, it's not working in compression. So that's a, we can just take away the material everywhere it's cracked. So this is a beam where we took the mold and just squeezed it together along with sort of more or less the 
the same distance of the cracks that you're going to Okay, you know it's going to crack there, so it's going to be the material. But what we were doing, of course, we were going to get into the truss back, from the back door to get into the truss. So instead of just pinching it on the cracks, what we should be doing was make a truss, where you take a whole portion and you it out. You can get wooden trusses, you can get steel trusses, but you don't see a lot of people working on so, the molds are complex, but here's a very simple mold. You have impactos, flat sheet of fabric, and you pull in the space between the impactos and the fabric pushes down and it struts. So it's a three part mold. Left, right, and middle. And that's a cast made from about like a five meter. So, what we're doing in research basically, how would I do we work on the models? And then we do a full scale proof of concept and move on. And then hope that the engineer somewhere will pick it up and, or a builder will pick it up and, uh, and use it. <coughs> the shape of these trusses can become uh, more interesting, also still in flat sheets. So here's a, a truss design that incorporates a uh, compression arch in blue and a cable structure in red. And Connect them together in the middle, connect the tension together in the middle, you end up with the bending moment curve for continuous D. You recognize that as recognizable curves, depending on the curve for continuous So these precast pieces you go together with a well put at the top and you produce continuous D, and that's the piece of the inflection points. That's reducing the span, that's actually the span of the system. That's the long span of the system. There's another idea. That means if you do this, we have to be able to provide columns that can receive this diagonal thrust and the compression options. And that's another story. Okay, so this book, friend book, that's three years of homework, it's all done. <laughs> the only thing missing is the chapter on how to make models, which I'm talking about today. I'm still working on. That would be that's a free web based chapter and that would be really good. So this, you know, connections, instruction details, examples of projects, and there's a history section. So fabric forming goes back at least I mean I reckon you know the Romans could have done it. They concrete um, so in the in the 1900s, uh, in the 1800s, Gustav Lillenthal, James Waller, who developed this very beautiful system of the in shell vault, uh, and that was Candela's very first in shell vault, was James Waller's method. He just took James Waller's method and made himself in shell vault, and then he was Candela who made the vault. James Waller didn't take off, he kept making, but he built James Waller, and he like, I don't know. How many hundreds of thousands of square meters of space that we have to build using the system? We got Fisak, which is some extraordinary ugly buildings. Guys, it's they're very beautiful, but you know there's some really ugly stuff in here. Guys, it's only fearless man. Really. And it's been also used in India and other parts of the world, very low. Um, Low capital, low tech for the environments where materials are far more expensive than labor, so the production material has an economic imperative. So these are reversed, reversed uh, wall shaped things to make uh, compression vaults. This would be an earth fill on top of this roof. And George Nez, who's and roof all over the world, made out of uh, fabric foam pipe bars and uh, fresh um, cement and latex shell. It's also used extensively all over the world in the mid 60s in uh, stream bed stabilization with that means underwater. This is a local community. It's taken right off their website recently, so this is a permeable fabric mold casting. 
inside, inside the wall. And for pipelines, remember how they make pipelines in the water? They put them in fabric form foundations. And drop a hose down and fill them with concrete from the barge. That's coming out of fish. <laughs> so that's standard operating procedure for that industry. Uh, what about this? These are units of time that mark the fall and the motion. These are units of space <coughs> marking the load. It's the same thing. One is in motion and it's falling, the other is static and not falling. But it's exactly the same thing, but transposed in a mysterious way. Here's Gadis, part of the Gadis studio. Gadis taking life casts for the sculpture program of the Sabbath community. Okay, my, Gaudi is my great great teacher. I'm convinced Gaudi is doing this life cast because he wants very much not to design anything, but to be to take dictation from the teacher. So he wants to, this is the life cast. This is from his gravity studies. He wants to know the position of Christ's body when he died. So he can make a proper crucifix. So he has his workers and maybe he did, I don't know. And develops this crucifix. This is Gabby's crucifix in stone of basically death by gravity. This is in the tradition, this, this crucifix is in the tradition of the depiction of Christ as a man, as opposed to the depiction of Christ as God. So it's just a cross shape, not a body. Okay. You know, and you can see you can do both kinds of crucifixes are available. You can start looking at the crucifixes that paint some of them gravity and some of them weightless. Gabby's famous hand of chain in Urdu is exactly. So here's a little experiment that I did with Grandma Pugeski in the music video, where we stacked up some bags of crap. Uh, and after they hardened, uh, we took them apart and undressed them, so it was just the grout, and put them back together. Now, they keep perfectly. They're like amorphous labels. So they keep perfectly. So you have a notionally a kind of masonry column. You need more than that. It could be possible to do more than that. But they keep perfectly. And then you can also stack them the other way. Now, I, the affect of this is quite different from the affect of this. This is sad. This is evil. <laughs> This is happy. No, what's that about? It's exactly the same thing, but you reverse the gravity and something quite different happens at the level of the affect. Let's say out your poetic charge and the affect of these objects. That's quite different. You can still feel them being squeezed. You still feel the pressure and you feel the action. And the energy in the thing that transposes it's so, it's so interesting. Now, structures in architecture in the machine modernist tradition either seeks to give you the illusion of effortlessness, or, and I don't know how to slide illustrate it, but you can easily imagine yourself some heroic aspect. You know, it's like working hard by this hero structure. Those are the two modes of poetic charge and machine modern structures. Gabiz is a tragic 
redemptive. Well, this is in part well. Uh, it's, a, it's a different mode. So Gaudi's architecture is going to pain and redemption and beauty in suffering. If you know why you're suffering, you can be beautiful. This is, I mean, I'm not saying I subscribe to this, I'm just giving you Gaudi's. My reading of Gaudi's architecture is power. <laughs> so here we go. Painting thing. You can jitify it with a layer of glass fiber refills concrete, cut and stick. Turn it over and use it as a mold precast to into the wall. Shells. But the problem with this shape is that this is a single curvature particular it's a curvature wall, which means as a thin shell, it's subject to buckling. Because if it's curved this way, this axis would be great. It's a straight line anywhere along it, so it would easily be cracked by this curved this paper. So we want a double curvature to make a proper shell. And here's some models, or little one ten models. You can see what happens with a flat sheet. That, uh, so this is just a sheet hanging on your own There's four support points. And it's forming what we call pull bubbles. So this, this is a push bubble. And that is a pull bubble. So the pull bubble forms between the two pull points along the principal line. And to stress, and the fabric buckles this way, like it's being compressed this way. That has something to do with the structure of the fabric, but it also has to do with the Poisson's ratio. And the fact that for every primary stress, it's a secondary stress, it's opposite. And then you can use another scoop of structural symmetry. That's why Collins balls, and that's why you're chewing up the scoop of the when you pull on this chewing gum, there's a compression force that comes out of nowhere and wishes it together. So this, along, that's the principle on tension to stress and it's being shot When you make a mold and then you make a shell from, from that kind of fabric, you can see that off the, off the so this is now we're looking up at a compression shell along from these supports, where the, where the uh, compression forces are the highest, and where the thin shell would be most subject to buckling, we have V corrugations, which look to me like a buckling resistance structure formed by the buckling weakness of the top shell. That's what I mean. I don't know if you're ready to say about that. But but every engineer I've ever asked to weigh in on this piece of mouse Because no one understands buckling. Buckling remains in this picture. You can do it, you can deal with it. But, uh, but the, deep, the deeper understanding is escapes us. Um, so this is an electronic piece of cloth that also buckles. Along the principle of the So, we want to use the pull buckles in the flat sheet. If you induce, if you pre stress this flat sheet with a single pull buckle, as if you let it here, here, and you load it, and hang it, and you jitify it, now you get a funicular uh, arch that has a double curvature and deep coordinations up in this shape. And this is a, a design for um, what I call a flay beam. It should act like a beam in the sense that it would exert no thrust on its supports. That's a beautiful thing about a beam. The internal supports has no thrust. That's very inefficient compared to the tension structure is the most efficient way to use the force. Pure linear compression, the second most efficient way of being my discipline. So we want a compression arch. 
of a nuclear shell, but we want to tie it back to itself. So the Axis of Pain, when you can pre these things, it could be done and not have to worry about buttressing the support. That's the rig. The piece of fabric is put across it, and a whole buckle is drawn across the middle of the piece of fabric. It's been beautified, turned over, there's the mold. So that's the cast from the mold. That's the one to ten mold. Okay, it works at one to ten, you go to one to one. That's how it works for years and years and years. It works at a one to ten model of versus full scale. Full scale, take this piece of fabric, full line, full buckle. And then load it with. Last five years, those concrete fabrics material has pretty good reflectual strength, and you can make a mold that way. So now it's it's let me stand that the pull buckle pull buckle is for the middle uh, the middle pull points, but this full part of the fabric is only held from that point and that point here. I'm going to start the same. You want this fabric to stress itself from support to support in pure tension. Those some ribs so you turn it over, and there's the mold. And you see the pull buckles running along the principal line of tension stress running to the support points. So that's our heat corrugations <coughs> compression shell. Now, we put the other shell. And because it's a flat sheet shape, you can reinforce this very easily with the flat sheet reinforcing pencil. Also right off the floor. And it also sets up the production, like the, the product that's produced off the mold. It's also set up, if you want it, to receive roll roofing, also in the flat sheet. So the flat sheet not only makes it simpler for anybody to make anywhere in the world without having to tailor it and figure it out of the back, but it also then simplifies construction down the line because of all these other materials that come in flat sheets. That will assume the same, even very complex geometry, it's still a flat sheet geometry. So that gets built like a lasagna. It's about an inch, inch and a half thick. Hold up. But you can feel the thing pulling itself across the space. <laughs> so it's alive. And so I mean them metaphorically, but I also don't mean them metaphorically. And that's this is this great thread going to the lecture of the, the aliveness of these things which are more bird than man, or bird man, but actually things. Now the dream of a mythic textile is as old as sculpture. In a, in a, in a dreaming of a mythic textile, they're dreaming of textiles, but the mythic textiles not the last. I was dreaming of mythic textiles. So this is my girl. This is cover my cover version of the you know, Roman sculpture. Trying to dream. I didn't know how to build it. It just seemed like I was going to concrete, beautiful traits, architecture to be like this. That's all it was, pure dream. And looking at a construction site and imagining it, and the wind blowing on these things, the bones underneath, you can see structural shape. So, actually possible, but not knowing how. Playing with fabric. And spraying it with a thin layer of plastic or copper, you can start to produce these little models of uh, lithic drapery. Now, this didn't seem like it was reasonable that you could make a little one to ten model and spray plastic and hang a piece of nylon and scale it up into a size. But every other one to ten model we ever made could work. So, Seemed worth the risk. 
Now the shapes that these things take are canonical shape. We know this shape of the scraper, which is slab. No. But I didn't I knew it, but I didn't know it. So I had to draw it to figure out what the hell the shape really was. And it's a very deep it's a very deep section. So this is a zigzag, it goes like this. So it's quite deep. And then those curves are tension marks. Those are the tension marks. So that's where the stress is in those curves. And in between is pretty slack. But I knew that from going up and patting this. And only when it was big you could feel the forces. So here's quite slack. But here along along these guys it's almost ridiculous. It's got force. You can palpate the fabrics feel what the force is. That's uh, that's basically this something like this. Straight and concrete. That's about a that's also about an inch inch and a half thick. Fiber reinforced concrete. Or you could hang a curtain, it's another kind of curtain. So you that and the curtain and spray that with shot creep. It seems unlikely. Seems crazy, but actually it works. You have to get the mix right. Uh, you have to get the mix right and get the fabric right. So these are drawings now that I've made, imagining, just to see, well, what, okay, what would an architecture be? What kind of architecture might that be? So this interspersed in this lecture are some drawings I made uh, in a series called the Hotel Edward Hopper, where I took uh, Edward Hopper paintings, projected them onto a blank piece of paper, and drew the people. Because it was the people I was interested in, this weird puppet, like, People, unhappy puppets from the Hopper paintings, and then built the space around them. And it turned into a hotel. I mean, I didn't plan to do it, but I was in the This is not from the hotel. The fabric one comes in now. I'm going to make this one. The fabric can also wrinkle. So instead of using that non pressurized, non energized uh, membranes, Plastic so that's something else that flash people do. It will wrinkle through. And that's a close up of the concrete surface. You see the heads of the stick. But you can also guide the wrinkle. You can draw with the wrinkles. So here's a way over which a piece of fabric goes. And you can draw. I don't have a photograph of the fabric, but basically you can hold this way and you can control where the wrinkles will end so when you make multiple casts, the wrinkles will line up. So you can make a draw with them. You make them go where you want them to go. But then at the same time, they produce their own extraordinary wind as a result. Here's a, a model of a flat face slab. Where the so it's just flat deck, five cap drops, just making bumps at the moment. The fabric goes over, and you see there's a lot of extra fabric now because the fabric's out of plane. You can do anything you want with it. You can make star shades, you can, you can make them go a little curve if you like. It's, you can make drawing with it. There's an infinite number of solutions to these extra, the extra fabric, infinite number of ways they can go. Within, right within the margins of what it is. So that gets that gets rigidified, the model with spray plaster and flipped over, and now we have a mold. This is the full scale version. And this is for a job we got canceled. But the push pins are now just uh, plywood discs and screws. And we have to make a drawing between this and the fabric and the wire the side. Here's a one-to-one -one test of how the fabric will work when the GFRC is on it. Those pipes are just so we can get in and get screws out. That's the casting surface of the mill. And that's the model of the slab. This is for a canopy. Canopy structure. Now, when you make a push buckle, let me start this. If you compress the fabric along one axis, you get a series of parallel wrinkles. 
direction. If you compress it in two directions, the fabric will spontaneously branch. Y shape. It's really Y shape. So there's a volume, you have a Y shaped volume that spontaneously forms from the top sheet. If you make a stencil frame, you can guide that natural buckler pattern to the shape that you want. And in this case, it's for a branching column. So it's basically two, two of these face to face matching perfectly. Now, they don't have to match. They could be different shapes on either side, as you see, or they could be like whatever. But in this case, we want them to match up so we can get a branching column. This goes back to the thinking about the, the arches of the vaults that are driving in a diagonal thrust, and how you want the column to receive those um, more efficient force flows. How is that in the hotel? And it's unclear to me whether that clock is a curtain or whether it's concrete. I believe it. That's a photograph of the former that I just showed you, the branching column. And this is a drawing which basically reproduces that as an exterior wall. You say, well, you don't have to take the former column. The former could be the wall, the infill wall, and the bulging could be the pilaster, which forms the structure. So that's just another thought experiment. <coughs> so here's the branching column as the receptor funnel receiving um, a series of infill arches, the vaults. And here's the model of a Y-shaped column where instead of having the two sides of the wall up against each other, you put a part to form a wall. You have a wall highlighting. And of course, fabric makes its own decoration. Always better. Always better than whatever I would call This is the scheme for using the same wall mold and just blocking out portions of the wall, just keeping all the little portions of the wall, let's say to make buttress column. So here's a, a column bulging out from the wall mold, but inside that's also available for the concrete flow into the rest of the wall blocked out. It brings that buttress column. Again, thinking of a diagonal um, a diagonal to the compression force. For a whole series of compression arches that are cast as if they were beams, but the beams are working for the compression. And at the end of the line, the beams is sheared off the thrust of the line. There's another model of a bulge wall. <coughs> That's the schematic wall. It gives you the possibilities. So these are these are modeling standard wall forms. There's a pack those, which will push the fabric covers this, right? So this pushes the fabric into the thickness of the wall. So the bees that will push in is also really tight. And then you cut out the, uh, the wall and the rest of the fabric falls out at the end of So you have a standard wall form and fabric uh, form line, which is quite ordinary way of constructing these matted walls. But now you have geometric freedom. You can pass outside the plane of the wall wall and you go inside the plane of the wall. Here's an example. And look how beautiful these three push pins. Look at this beautiful complex form developed purely by the fabric itself as it decides how to solve the surface problem. There's a big one. I'm sure that you can be able to see. Four months out of the year, I live on an island off the coast of Maine, otherwise I'd be happy. When we arrive, no human beings can touch. It's kind of a little place. And there's no well, there's no electric grid, there's no um, roads. Um, so when you walk, you have to be careful. 
And um, so the fourth floor is this, um, yeah. this is a drawing that I made that I call Emblem of the Fourth Floor. And we'll just go inside this drawing. Can't spend long um, and six months out of the year, lately, I live in Istanbul. This is a map of the Domish. The Domish is an um, informal public transport system. Formal, informal. It's not municipally run, it's, it's people running. And there's no map of the system. So this is, a, this is an attempt to make a map of the system from the cell phone. Yeah. People sending their cell phone data to this place in the That's chaos. But it's quite brilliant. A uh, robust system of transport. In Istanbul and Turkey, nothing moves in the street. It's all flow. It's a culture that's really flow and improvisation. It all works most of the time. I mean, it doesn't work as a fix. It's a very practical fix. It's just something. So between the fourth floor and Istanbul, there's something held in common. Really admirable and beautiful to me. This is a drawing that I made in the early 90s while really teaching in Istanbul and Turkey in general. This collage, very powerful. This is now some research methods, another part of research methods. Collage. So you fragment a known whole, reorient, recombine, recombine. A thing, the, uh, the dictionary tells us, means a gathering. The root meaning is a gathering. The Norwegian parliament is called the thing. So anything is already a gathering of some other things, which are itself a gathering and so forth. This is a painting that I painted in Holland. So that's a kind of obliteration or being working on top of an existing painting. It's a kind of fragmentation that I put in the Here's a photograph reoriented and now blacked out. To discover within the photographic reality a hidden thing which was not and for the black art stuff. By this time of renunciation, you discover something else. It was encoded in the original image. You thought you knew what it was. So these are methods, these are methods that have informed my drawing practice. And are methods that are uh, absolutely tied um, in some weird way to the technical work as well. So this is a larger photo collage that's been blacked out. And this is a drawing, this is a drawing I just finished um, So, that's my new baby. <laughs> and we'll just go inside this drawing. Uh, it's this big. It's this big. And, and I'll show you how it's made. With a different drawing, I'll show you how it's made. So we'll go inside. There's worlds within worlds. You see photographs in there, huh? Kind of photographs in there. You see, here's how one of these drawings is made. It starts with a lot. So I take photographs. But here's a drawing such as this. There's some little motors I saw in Hong Kong. Sure. Right. Trips are almost electronic. Mm -hmm. So here's three, uh, two cultural artifacts. 
one old, 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 one tree new, and then it's nature. And it's a really Make a collage, Photoshop. Print it on a piece of paper, and then kind of like blacking it out and kind of like painting over the painting, draw and discover these other uh, worlds and other things, other gatherings that are encoded. So you get to choose, this is the fascinating way of drawing them, because you get to choose the genetics, the cultural or physical or formal genetics that you wish to see combined. What happens if we take machine and jellyfish, you know, robot and jellyfish. And of course, I mean, this is happening right now somewhere in MIT, for God's sake, someone's taking the jellyfish and the robot. It's happening already. But the, um, so you can choose which direction you wish to explore, and then the hallucinating part is the part where you find stuff that you didn't know was there. And these things emerge to vision exactly the way you see things in clouds when you stare at them. It's the capacity that we have as human beings is innate. Leonardo tells his advice to a young painter, gives exactly this advice. He says, stare at a water stained wall and you will see it in many wonders. So this is the this is the method. And uh, if you have a good collage to start with, you're going to get it from. You've got a good chassis to start with. And it's completely non punitive If you fuck up, you just make another print to start again. So you can relax. And relaxation is a prerequisite for making a drawing anyway. But relax and have that fun. Otherwise, you make that drawing. Right. So, this is a, a highly recommended. Research method. Right. So these are things which self form. They're guided. You, get, you choose, let's say, the boundary conditions, and you choose the formal genetics of the thing, but then they self form. And in the self forming, you find the final date, the final form is found. But at the same time, the researcher finds other things as well. The fact that these fabric cast things look like bodies of clothing, it's a formal coincidence. Which is to say, it's a formal coincidence. Your body and everyone else's body, and the body of every living thing, is made with inflated membranes. At the cellular level, that's true. This is an inflated membrane. So it creates a certain class of forms, and the coincidence, the coincidence, when you use flesh and mold and put concrete, you get very similar forms. It's the same kind of mechanics. And then the other way of doing the fabric, which is the non-pressurized part, is like this, like all of this. And I put it to you that textiles are the quintessential human technology. For all of our artifices, it's textiles which are the most human, the closest. And my argument for this is that you imagine when you were born, you came out here. And what was the first thing that happened to you? You were wiped off the textile and you reacted to the textile. And the number of hours you've spent in your life, of, unless you were thought you knew this company, the, in which case you have more hours than most, but the number of hours you spend in your life where your body's not touching the textile, is amazing. That's a human life. So we have this, and then we have this. And the, the textile molds have both uh, voices innately in them. So we have a way of speaking in architectural language, and structural and architectural language, which is innately human and innately alive in certain ways that are um, complex. 
Now, what to do with them? I don't know what to do. I make little drawings of massive architectures. I don't know what would an architecture be like. This is a this is machine this is machine stuff. This is all a machine. That's been machine. It's been machine stuff since the invention of machine bodies. Before that, it's all bodies, bodies of vegetables, and compression arches. You know, I mean, that's the whole the whole history. Now, this is the end of the lecture, but I could go on because there's more. Like maybe you need to exclude it.